STEM fans, are you ready? Let's hear it for the world-class NASA STEM Stars team. From NASA centers across the country, we present Nathan Abraham. Hello, my name is David Alexander, connecting to you from the Armstrong Flight Research Center, and welcome to NASA STEM Stars, where students connect firsthand with NASA scientists, engineers, and innovators to learn more about NASA missions, career paths, and opportunities. So in today's mission, we're actually going to talk about thermal coatings. NASA's molecular thermal coatings has shielded some of NASA's highest profile space technologies from potential harmful molecular contamination. Joining us today is Nithin Abraham. She's a coatings engineer from the Goddard Space Flight Research Center in Maryland. We welcome you to the program. And again, thank you so much for being here, Nithin. Nithin is going to share. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Nithin is going to share a little bit about her background, her career experiences, and the work that she actually does for NASA, and specifically how she leads research and development efforts on space flight coatings and materials. So as you're listening to her share her story, we actually want for you to come up with some questions to ask her. So about half of our time is gonna be devoted to answering your questions. So please enter those questions in the chat throughout our conversation today, and we'll actually try and answer them all before we wrap up for the day. Without that, I mean, hey, you know, we don't have any interaction here, you know? <laughs> so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Nathan, to get us started. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Nithin Abraham. I am a coatings engineer at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, which is located in Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, and to start off, I just wanna share my educational background. I attended Manhattan College in Riverdale, New York, where I received my bachelor's degree and my master's degree in chemical engineering. I also have minors in mathematics and chemistry. Wow, well, you're definitely a hard worker, especially with your level of education, but I know you have to have some kind of free time for yourself. So what do you actually do during uh, your free time? So I really enjoy um, cooking, um, specifically experimenting with um, Indian inspired cuisine. Um, recently, I've um, really enjoyed playing board games um, and I'm also really into art. I love creating drawing, painting, um, uh, designing more recently. So, and my current interests include material science, uh, technology and innovation, and also empowering women in STEM because we are a minority in the STEM field. Wow. Um, so, you know, I'm a Monopoly player myself. Uh, what, what kind of board games are you actually into? So I guess more recently, I've uh, been really enjoying tile-based strategy games. And my current favorite right now is playing Carcassonne, which is okay. a tile-based uh, game. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty awesome. Very strategic, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> um, and you said that you're into the arts. That's really good. Uh, what kind of uh, painting are you actually into? So I guess when I have more time on my hands, I really enjoy working with acrylics and watercolors, um, but I haven't had a lot of time to do that recently. So I'm focusing mainly on graphic design and graphics, I guess. Okay, that's, that's beautiful. Now, uh, what role do you actually play in empowering women? I know that you had mentioned that that was one of your interests. I think that's phenomenal. Right. <laughs> so recently, a group of women engineers at Goddard, um, including myself, we formed a, a women engineers group uh, to help address um, issues and topics related to women engineers. So I'm really happy and proud to be a part of that group at Goddard. Well, that's that's very empowering um, altogether. Um, we definitely need programs such as that. Um, can you actually tell us uh, a little bit more about your journey to NASA? Right. Okay, so I was born in India, and when I was 
about the age of three years old, I immigrated to the United States with my family. Uh, we settled in New York. So I was raised in New York and went to school in New York. Um, and growing up, um, I never really, I guess, was interested in engineering. I was mostly interested in art, um, but I also noticed that I was really good at math and chemistry. And it was actually my guidance counselor in high school who introduced me to engineering. She noticed that I had academic strengths in these two areas, math and chemistry, and recommended that I pursue chemical engineering um, in college and explore that area. And so um, I took her advice and in college, I pursued chemical engineering. Um, it was very challenging, but I worked really hard and I was still interested in exploring the different career paths that a chemical engineer could pursue. Uh, so as a result, I participated in various internship opportunities just to understand what exactly um, a career a chemical engineer can do in, in, in industry. So that off gave me a lot of um, experience and background knowledge to help me make my decision. And NASA was actually never, I never dreamed of working at NASA because I didn't know that it was an opportunity or a possibility. Um, I never met someone who worked at NASA or knew like what types of opportunities were available. Uh, NASA came into the picture when I was looking for jobs um, and went to a career fair in Washington, DC. I saw the, the NASA outreach booth at the career fair and I stopped and was in awe at the, I guess the NASA logo. I'm like, wow, it's so awe-inspiring, but I can't work there. Like I'm not, like I don't, I don't know if I belong there. So what really helped was I developed enough courage to walk up to the career fair booth where NASA recruiters were there and I actually talked to them, asked them questions, found out like what are the different opportunities that are there? How can I contribute to the whole overall mission and mission of the agency? And so I learned a lot, I gave in my resume and I was offered a summer internship as a result of that um, initial net networking um, interaction. And so I, I spent my summer at NASA Goddard. I really enjoyed the the culture, the environment, and I could picture myself working there. And so during the summer, uh, during my internship, I networked with different branches, trying to understand what all the different areas were. And I was offered a full-time job in the uh, contamination and coatings engineering group um, at NASA Goddard, where I have been a coatings engineer for the last 10 years. Um, and I'm still counting. I really love my job and I really love what I do. And I think that's very important for students to find out. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not every day that you speak with a, a coatings engineer, uh, especially at NASA. So can you clarify a little bit, like what does a, a coatings engineer do at NASA? Right, so a coatings engineer, as a coatings engineer, I provide technical expertise on spaceflight thermal control coatings. So anytime there's an issue um, related to coatings or if I need to provide recommendations or consultations, I'm your person. Um, I'm also involved with technology development of new coatings and materials. And specifically, I'm working on uh, the molecular adsorber coating, which I will talk about in a bit. Um, but as a NASA coatings engineer, I get to work on really cool NASA missions that are meant to um, meant for space exploration and scientific discoveries. Um, I specifically work on astrophysics missions, earth science, heliophysics, and planetary science missions. That's all really cool. Um, currently, the mission that I'm supporting is the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. And this is a very cool mission. It's named after an inspiring woman named Nancy Grace. Uh, she was the first chief of astronomy and she's considered the, the mother of Hubble for all of her efforts in making the Hubble Space Telescope a reality. And this mission is going to study um, all the mysteries of dark matter and dark energy and can't wait for this mission to, um, to proceed forward. Okay, very cool. So I have a question uh, from a very curious student here and they essentially want to know um, all together, what type of uh, subjects uh, do chemical engineers uh, or other branch of, of chemical engineers have to take? What type of courses do they have to take? Or what kind of courses did you have to take in, in your college? So you, I guess all the math classes, calculus, um, chemistry, organic chemistry, 
uh, physical chemistry, and there's also chemical engineering specific classes like um, um, heat transfer, fluids, um, very complex <laughs> classes. They were all, in my opinion, challenging, but I did learn a lot by taking those classes and lots of laboratory work as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, earlier today, I know we talked a little bit more about your interest uh, as well as art. And the students uh, basically asking a question here, do you find that your artistic interests play an integral role in your uh, career life? Yeah, so I guess it's part of who I am. So it transfers over to my work, um, whether the way I present a presentation or the way I um, write a report, I feel like the creativity is transferred in my work. Okay. And uh, one other student has a question on here, specifically saying, how does it actually feel to uh, work at NASA as a codings engineer? And what does your environment look like at work? So um, it's it's actually very exciting. Um, other, like when I'm not like responding to emails or attending meetings, I get to work in a laboratory environment um, where I can perform and lead research and development efforts. Um, here um, on the screen is a picture of me uh, developing uh, special coatings in our laboratory. Um, so that's definitely exciting. It's very hands-on. Okay. And I, I think that's uh, really terrific altogether. Um, and so with respect to that, uh, how important is uh, teamwork uh, at NASA? I mean, do you work independently? Because a lot of times people think, oh, that person's working in a lab, they're just working independently. So uh, how important is uh, teamwork to NASA and the missions? So teamwork is very important. You have to learn how to work with different people, different personalities, because in the end, um, you're not the expert in everything. You need help from other people. So um, I work with multiple disciplines on, on, uh, on projects. They can range from scientists, engineers, technicians. Um, I work with other coatings engineer. Uh, shown on the screen there, I'm working with a materials engineer in her lab. Um, some other disciplines can include thermal, optics, systems engineers, uh, quality assurance. So the main goal is you have to work as a team in order to meet the end goal. And so that's what's important. So collaboration is key. Awesome. And uh, I mean, you, you definitely spoke about a lot of different types of uh, careers uh, here at NASA. So I definitely implore uh, or challenge many of the students to take a look at uh, many of those careers that uh, you can possibly have here at NASA one day. Now, what about uh, partnerships uh, and collaboration? So, uh, so the technologies we make for NASA uh, can eventually be used here on Earth, and that process is called technology transfer. And as someone who works on technologies, I'm also involved with supporting strategic technology transfer partnerships. Um, which mean, um, you know, transferring that technology here on Earth. So in the past, examples of NASA technologies that have turned, um, that are here for use are things like hair straighteners, temper foam material, baby formula, um, he, um, heart pumps. And one of the examples I can give is I currently have a NASA Space Act agreement with the Smithsonian Institution, the Natural National Museum of Natural History, and we're working to see if the coatings that were developed are being are are possibly used on museum conservation efforts for contamination. Oh. Wow, that is like so innovative. You would have never thought that the space technology could be utilized in a museum. How cool is that? That's an awesome spin-off technology um, that you guys are trying to develop there. So You've been working at NASA for over a decade. It's about 10 years. And that amounts to you know, many, many different types of experiences and missions. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, coatings, more specifically the thermal coatings that you work on? Great. Uh, so <clears throat> thermal coatings are very unique materials. They play a very important role because they provide passive thermal control management. And what, what I mean was, by this is that the coatings itself, they have thermal properties that help control the temperatures of your spacecraft, of your satellites, of your instruments, of your telescopes, so that they're operating in its operational condition um, and range. 
So there are some coatings that either radiate heat away from the spacecraft or regulate heat from the spacecraft. Um, to give you an example, say you have a two cars that are parked outside on a really hot sunny day. If one has one is a black colored car, it's going to absorb a lot more of that energy from the sun, the heat. So it's going to feel a lot um, hotter than say a car that's a lighter colored material such as white or beige. So in a sense, uh, coatings regulate temperatures similar to that. Uh, thermal coatings can include a variety of things. They can include spray applied uh, paints and primers. Um, to give you an example on the picture that you see here, um, on the left is uh, TEARS and on the right is the ATLAS instrument on ISAT-2. The white areas you see there are white uh, radiator coatings. Um, you can also, also have uh, thin film coatings which are vacuum deposited. Um, also space insulation blankets, reflective tape materials as well. Okay, and uh, can you talk a little bit more about the molecular contaminants? Let's dive a little bit more into that. Right, so molecular contaminants, um, they're not good. <laughs> they pose a significant threat to our NASA um, science and exploration missions because of the materials that um, are wanting to outgas. So these materials come from materials that we use in our, in our spacecraft normally. And when you put them in vacuum or when they're flying in orbit, the molecules want to get released and outgas. And this is very dangerous because it can deposit on your very critical sensitive surfaces. It can degrade the performance of your um, operational lifetime of your satellites, your telescopes and your instruments. Um, so just to give you an example of what um, outgassing is or how molecules are being released, um, say you have a new, you buy a new car and it has that new car smell associated with it. And that smell is occurring because all the molecules are being released into the air and you're breathing it in. Um, so that's not really good for humans. So similarly, when these molecules of a spacecraft are being released within the cavity, um, they have that potential to deposit on, say, a critical mirror surface and um, degrade that from working. Um, so as a result, um, a team of engineers and I, uh, we uh, developed a molecular adsorber coating and it's meant to capture these contaminants. So this coating works because it uh, has a porous structure such as the images shown there, high surface area and roughness so that the contaminants could get captured on the coating itself rather than deposit say on a very sensitive optics surface. Mm -hmm. So uh, in general, uh, what you're saying is, is that these actual coatings are very important because, um, because of outgassing, for example, you may actually uh, not be able to uh, optically, if you have, for example, I know you're working on a telescope, let's say that uh, you won't be able to see as good as you possibly could because of these actual contaminants. Right. So think of like your phone screen. So if there's a smudge on your phone screen, you can't really see or read your text messages or view a video because there's that layer of contaminant. So we don't want that to happen on a very sensitive mirror surfaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome. Um, we have a, a question from a student uh, basically asking what type of classes would the high school student need if they're interested in uh, engineering? So definitely math, so algebra, uh, calculus, um, and then taking the standard uh, science classes, so chemistry and physics. So those are very important to take for preliminary um, engineering classes in high school. And, mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, another student is asking, uh, what type of advice would you give a young student aspiring to actually be a part of NASA? So definitely talk to NASA, NASA professionals, engineers, scientists, ask them what they do in their career. Um, and if you can, um, ask if you can shadow them for a day. Um, there's also opportunities for internships. Um, like I said earlier, internships allow you to explore all these diverse career paths and gain that valuable experience. Um, you may like, you may think you like something, but when you actually try it, you find out you don't like it. So it's better to find out uh, during your internship experience to see if you do or don't like. And you may also explore something you've never thought you knew you would like. 
Um, it also gives you opportunity to network with uh, career professionals, ask them advice for questions. Um, mentorship is very important um, in your career. And I guess as you're going into school and college as well. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, uh, a mentor in your life or career life that uh, particularly stood out for you? I actually have several, several mentors. Um, without them, I don't think I would be where I am today. Um, I have uh, two mentors in my group that I look up to. Um, I go to them for advice, um, for um, ad and also they advocate for me. Um, I also um, um, get support from my supervisor, which is very important. Um, so I feel like without them as part of my team, um, I would not be where I am today. Yeah, definitely. Very true altogether. Do you have a, any particular NASA memories that have stood out for you? I just, I guess I like um, when I get to see the hardware in the clean room. Um, it's really exciting because when you're working on something in the lab and then you finally see it um, all integrated together, it's really inspiring and it makes you all excited and can't wait for it to launch into space and do the really cool science that it's meant to do for us. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how often do you actually have to suit up and uh, get into uh, a bunny suit uh, in order for you to, uh, you know, uh, research coatings or apply coatings? So I get to do it occasionally. Um, there are two instances. Um, when, when the hardware leaves our coatings facility, it eventually goes in and gets integrated with the rest of the spacecraft and goes through testing. And so sometimes I'm called in to go into the clean room and look at or inspect the thermal coating surfaces just to make sure they're still in good condition um, and give back any feedback. The other time I get to wear a clean room suit is when I'm, uh, when I get to install uh, molecular adsorber coating samples for um, inside vacuum chambers for specific missions. Um, so I get to, yeah, so in the picture there, I'm wearing a clean room suit or a bunny suit and I'm shown um, installing a white MAC colored sample on in the plenum of Chamber A, which is located at NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And we use these coatings to help protect the uh, telescope from contamination that was present in the, the vacuum chambers. So those are just okay, two there. examples of to go to the clean room. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, very awesome on this end. So uh, let's see here. Wanted to check out uh, YouTube, see if we have any other questions uh, for you on this end. It looks like we definitely clarified a question about what a clean room is altogether. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the chemistry that you've actually uh, implemented? So in other words, are you, in terms of you utilizing your background, do you have to actually uh, work with different chemicals to create this or do you have to find other or, or do you have to research other different types of coatings that you apply onto your different uh, spacecraft? I think, I think both. Um, so the, I, so I guess, uh, can you, I guess, can you repeat the question again? Yeah. So uh, in other words, you know, you indicated that you're a developer of uh, you know, the chemistry that's used on these coatings. So do you, mm -hmm. as a chemist, do you have to create your own uh, chemicals or do you have, to, and, or do you have to like research other chemicals uh, that are applied? You know, let's just say a universe comes up, uh, a university comes up with some new type of coating or something like that. Uh, would you research those types and then see if those will actually work on NASA spacecraft? Right, so we have to use different types of chemicals and different uh, materials, but the main thing is we have to make sure that it survives space because space uh -huh. is really harsh. So, and the materials that we send to space have to be very durable. So in space, you have vacuum, you have a lot of radiation, atomic oxygen, UV, there's all these proton electron charge particles it can be really hot, really cold. So we have to, whatever materials or chemicals we use, we have to make sure we do adequate testing to make sure that it's going to survive 
and mostly like survive also the launch, um, like all the acoustic vibrations um, that the coating may or material may experience when it gets sent to space. Okay. So um, last question on this end, do you have any final thoughts or any advice uh, for our students that are out there today? So I guess if you're interested in STEM, uh, make sure you study really hard, um, mainly math, science, engineering, technology related courses. Um, and if it is cha challenging, don't give up, keep trying um, and ask for help. You have your professors, your parents, um, they're, they're, they're willing to help you. Um, and also if you see somebody that you think is doing a cool job, just talk, go, go and talk to them. They're willing to share their work experience with you, um, give you advice. So in that same respect, um, ask them to be your mentor if, and see where it goes. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you on that. So um, looks like we're just about out of time for today. But before we go, we have a student challenge for you. So we're challenging you to complete the build a heat shield activity on page 29 of the crew transportation Orion guide. So you will actually design and build a heat shield that will protect the contents of a crew module represented by candy from a simulated atmospheric reentry you can use a hairdryer. So you can actually see the link there to the activity and that would actually take you to the next gen site. So you can actually begin completing your spacecraft. And we actually hope that you will share your work with us uh, and your activity at hashtag next gen STEM. So two more things before we wrap it up. I want to say thank you to Nith and Abraham for coming on our show today. It was great talking with you and learning more about your amazing career at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Lastly, please join us for our next STEM Stars in Espanol chat on October 13th at 4 p.m. Eastern time, where we're actually gonna learn more about students and their experiences with world-class internships at NASA. So thank you all for attending. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you next time. Take care and have a great day. Bye.